So welcome or welcome back to another episode of the Investigating Pathways podcast. Today, I'm uh, excited to be joined by Chris Vader. Chris is a five times founder, starting off with web development from what I know, then launching a few uh, incredibly popular social apps, including Fligo, which I think launched out of Y Combinator, Treehouse, which was acquired by Google, uh, The Secret app, and most recently, uh, and correct me if I'm mispronouncing this, Chris, uh, Icaria. Um, so Chris, thank you so much for being here and taking the time to speak with me. Thanks so much for having me. Sure. So Chris, for those listening who don't know very much about who you are and what you're working on at the moment, could you tell me a little bit about who you are and what is it that you do? That is the ultimate question. Um, so, uh, by trade, I'm a software engineer and product designer. I've been doing that since the age of 14. So it's been over 20 years now. Um, <clears throat> my focus has always been around, I realized kind of like social experiments and, you know, how we can use technology to connect in more meaningful and interesting ways. And my latest venture is another kind of chapter in that. <clears throat> and right now we're actually currently working on a new product, which is still a bit under wraps, but we're looking to, um, <clears throat> help, I think for millennials in particular, as you get into your thirties and beyond, um, staying in touch with people actually is not as, uh, kind of, it's not granted as it is when you're younger and you're in yeah. school. So <clears throat> we're trying to build a, a product that's going to help people, uh, keep in better touch, um, and have more meaningful conversations, um, and maintain a lot more continuity and context in their relationships. And, um, so that's what we're working on now and be excited to share more when it's ready. Nice. So let's briefly talk about your origin story, right? So could you tell me a little bit about your life as a kid leading up to going to college? I know you mentioned just now that you've been doing web development and things like that from the age of 14. So could you tell me and expand a little bit on that? For sure. So when I was, yeah, when I was a kid, I was really into video games. I mean, I still play, but it was a, it was a very much a constant in my life back then. And that led me to get involved in, um, something called a t a MUD, which is a text-based RPG. And uh, the way that it worked back then was you to be able to download kind of source code. It was open source and you could create your own version of that game <clears throat> and modify it. And so after playing for a while, I really wanted to kind of like create my own world and modify it. So I tried to do that and I downloaded the code base and uh, I was not <laughs> very successful in figuring it out, just kind of twisting knobs and changing values and breaking things. Um, so I got lucky to uh, meet a, a friend at my friend's barbecue when I was 14, who was a, a like a, an older guy who was a software engineer. And I told him I was learning to code or trying to, and he kind of took me under his wing and um, his name was Rob Raish. And he really brought me like up to speed in all these different languages. And uh, that's what led me to get kind of my first job. Uh, with a friend of his named Doug at a company called Data uh, back in the day, which I believe was acquired by Yahoo. And so I started out as uh, just a kid doing kind of Perl, really still learning, getting my bearings. Um, and at the time, I think I was also kind of working at the grocery store, bagging groceries, which I was not a big fan of. <laughs> and as soon as it, it occurred to me that I could make a living or at least make an earning uh, doing web development, um, I started to, to look into that and start started to do consulting. Um, so that was pretty much like throughout, I'd say high school, uh, I would be playing games and then, you know, coding up stuff related to that. I might join like, a, you know, <laughs> Quake was the first person shooter back then. Um, I would, had like a clan that we played as part of and I would, to build our website or build a roster management system or whatever it came up. Like I always enjoyed uh, trying to make tools for, you know, the things that lacked from uh, in the areas of interest, in my areas of interest, in my community as well. Uh, and I didn't end up really going to college. To, it's complicated. I mean, I took some classes, but after I graduated, I became a full-time programmer. Uh, my mentor, Rob, actually got me a job. So I, was, I graduated when I was 17, um, and I 
was a full-time PHP developer uh, developing a knowledge base for a company called I Make News, um, which is, I think, still around. And it was kind of like constant contact. Um, it was an email kind of newsletter builder um, and mailing list manager. Um, after that, I ended up dabbling and taking some night classes uh, at Boston University where my mom worked. And um, during the day, I did. I got a job there on the on the website, working on the website. And I kind of continued developing PHP and worked on um, their kind of forum software. And they kind of yeah. Styling it. And uh, after that, I basically got in this pattern of, uh, you know, I'm not making enough money. I'm not like I should be paid more. I should be paid more. Like, that was my kind of attitude when I was when I was younger and that led me to like continuously kind of look for opportunities and, and eventually found another uh, job at a company called uh, Advisors, I believe, and they did student loan consolidation and I had an opportunity to join and, and kind of lead their building out their CRM, <clears throat> um, again, using PHP. Uh, and that was really cool because I was working on a small team. The company was maybe like seven or eight people, maybe 10, and there was a customer service team. Uh, and so the applicant tracking system that I built was like used by them every day. And that was my first kind of real, I'd say, cool experience where it was having impact. And you're working with people that are using the product and you're just really tight feedback loop um, and able to iterate on, on features uh, very quickly. So I did that for a while. And um, all this, by the way, I should say Massachusetts. I grew up outside of Boston, and uh, these jobs were kind of like scattered around the Boston area. <laughs> so after, uh, I should mention actually, when I worked at Boston University, I, I met uh, my future co-founder uh, Dan Rhodes. We worked together on the website in this room that we called the dungeon because there was no no windows. <laughs> I can't believe we spent eight hours a day in there, but. Um, that came up later because uh, as I was going through all these different jobs, eventually, um, I this is, this is a really interesting uh, kind of turning point for me. When I was, um, at this point, I must have been like 21, I think. I <clears throat> was looking for a new job and there was this one job that was like really high paying at the time. It was like 70, 70 grand a year, which at the time was like a lot for me. Um, with uh, your generation in terms of the inflation and all that but back then it was it, that was significant and um, I also had one more interview to go to after I interviewed for that job uh, when I had interviewed for the the higher paying job I was like oh I was very excited this is the one that I want to take and then I went and to, I had one more interview um, I didn't really want to go but I told myself uh, just be thorough right like follow through, maximize your optionality. And I was I showed up for this interview and uh, I'm in like a suit and I walk into this uh, office and it's got this kind of like open uh, desk layout. Everybody's kind of sitting in the same space. There's a pool table, there's a couch. It's like a vibe. And I, I immediately was like, I did not dress appropriately for this this uh, meeting. And that was the first time I actually had ever seen a startup as we kind of, uh, as they became kind of popularly understood in Silicon Valley, um, these kind of more free spirited, open kind of environments. And um, so I interviewed there. And when I walked out, I just knew that I wanted to work there. And um, they made an offer shortly afterwards and their offer came in at 40 a year so it was a significantly lower pay cut. and even there was no question in my mind that I was going to take that job <laughs> but you know I tried to negotiate a little bit and um, ended up taking the job and I think the big lesson for me there and this is something that I look for and the people that I work with and people that work on on our team is you know that you'd be willing to make that decision because you really believe in, the, in what that community culture company represents um and ever since then i kind of wasn't have been in the startup world um so i stayed at that company it was called pure volume um and also they built something called verb 
B-I-R-B, which was a really beautiful social network. Um, they had a like button before the Facebook like button. I don't know if that's necessarily a good thing anymore because we don't look at it so favorably, but it, it was it was really cool to be part of that team. And um, my friend Dan, meanwhile, had been working on a site called Glumber. And what that site did was, this is before kind of viral videos, viral was even a term. Um, he would okay. scour the internet and find like three to five videos every day. And he would just post that on the site. So it was you know, very consumable. And I would check it every day. And I was, it, it was always guaranteed to be entertaining. And um, lo and behold, his company eventually got acquired or he got an acquisition offer. Um, and this is just, he was just one guy, like three to five weeks on his site, making like $60,000 a month um, just off of ads. Wow. And, and so, so yeah, it was doing really well and he decided uh, to sell it. Uh, I think there was a, a lot of copyright issues kind of coming up and stuff like that, that he didn't want to have to weather. So he reached out to me and said, hey, um, I want to build another thing. Yeah. That sounded really interesting to me. Um, so I've always been kind of drawn towards the adventure. And um, I ended up leaving uh, Pure Volume. And um, at that point, I, yeah, I still didn't really have anything, any money in savings. Um, so I took on consulting and I would consult four hours in the morning, um, you know, kind of helping people with their websites. And then the rest of the day beyond would be spent building um, Flego. And so Flego yeah. was the very first, my very first startup, just to reset. <laughs> I know that was a lot. Um, and please stop me if you have any questions or you want to kind of uh, sure. steer it in this so I think, direction. Yeah, I think um, bringing us to Flego is a really smart thing. So first, I just want to say your friend's company sounds a whole lot like a predecessor to like Vine and TikTok. Um, is that actually how it ended up looking? I mean, from my understanding, it sounds like that, but I'm not sure. Well, well this was before we had iPhones. So okay. um, <laughs> it, I think it's in the same spirit. Yeah. Where like, you know, you have this meme content that can be really engaging and do, do its rounds, but this was, there was no real source for that before. And then YouTube okay. didn't have, if you go to YouTube's homepage, it was just never interesting. I mean, it still is never interesting. Um, they didn't have any recommendations uh, or anything like that to, to make it compelling. Um, so that's actually why we started Fligo was because we wanted to recreate that experience from Glumber where you come to the homepage and you're guaranteed to be entertained. Got it. So what I'm most curious about um, when we get before like we get into what exactly Fligo was is how did you end up moving from web development and design to building a like social media focused uh, startup? That's a good question. So when we built Fligo, it wasn't really social media necessarily. Um, I think for me personally, when I think of social apps, it's, it's um, something that you do with your friends um, versus like a Reddit which is more, it is social, of course, it's a community, but it's kind of not, uh, it's outside of your immediate relationships um, from what I understand. And so something like, and same with something like YouTube, it's not necessarily something you're doing to keep up with your friends or interacting with your friends, though you certainly can, um, but that doesn't seem to be, be the job in this case. So when we started, uh, it wasn't really something that, to do with your friends. We were just kind of building this video site. And honestly, I mean, we had no idea really what we were doing. We we're just kind of, uh, at, you know, following our impulses and our gut at that point. Um, so we did Fligo and then eventually we, get, we got to Treehouse. Um, got and that's, that's when things kind of pivoted to become more of a, what I would say, a, so, uh, so, a social media. Sure. So um, going back to like the beginning of Fligo, why you mentioned that uh, you were very into the adventurism side of things. And so I want to expand a little bit on that, right? Could you tell me a little bit about why you decided to become an entrepreneur in the first place? Uh, I don't know if it was quite a conscious decision. <laughs> um, I, so I can kind of reflect maybe and now knowing what I know now, um, I can, some light on that. 
I think that there's, uh, for me, I, I never really enjoyed school, for example. And the reason wasn't uh, because I don't enjoy learning or I don't value education. It was because I was forced to do things that I wasn't interested in. Um, and so for me that like when it's not immediately clear why I need this, uh, it's very hard. I, I have like a physical resistance to it. And um, so I think autonomy and the kind of freedom of expression and, and uh, the ability to explore creatively um, were all things that I wasn't aware at the time, but were driving my behavior. So I think when uh, the opportunity pre presented itself to uh, essentially leave a company and do my own thing, it, it came with the idea of, I think, freedom. Like I can try any, I don't need to get permission um, and I can kind of go and do my own thing. Um, and a val another value that emerged for me, I think also is originality and being able to, and what that means is I think being able to have the opportunity to come up with something that nobody's ever seen before. Um, now, of course, everything is derivative to some extent, but it's about creating that feeling in somebody where they're like, wow, this is really cool. I've never seen this before. And it allows you to yeah. have that experience, allows you to have new experiences, you know, to kind of expand your mind or uh, expand your uh, in internal landscape. Um, so I think that that's what ultimately drove me. So I, I would classify myself as a creative um, and then necessarily businessman, if you will. Um, I, I gravitate a lot more to, towards the product and design side of things. Got it. So now uh, I want to talk about the launch of Fligo and with that, like your Y Combinator experience, right? So given that you were one of the earliest YC batches, what was it? Um, I remember reading the summer 08, right? Um, right? Yeah. So that was like what batch number five or six of YC. What was that experience like? like? That, yeah. Yeah. What was, uh, <laughs> tell me a little bit about that experience. Yeah. That experience was um, really life-changing uh, before. So <laughs> the story of how we got into YC is actually one that's worth sharing as well. This is a good one. Uh, so, when, and, and then I'll get, get it, I'll end in the, how, what the experience is like. But when we first started working on Fligo, uh, we were kind of seeding viral videos um, and that was driving a lot of traffic. And where would we seed them? We would seed them on Reddit, Dig, and uh, the Delicious, which was a social bookmarking site. There's these places that people would go to and uh, so we would be posting on Reddit often, and we hit the front page of Reddit many times with our videos. And uh, we got wind of um, Reddit doing a, a happy hour. They were doing a, this thing called the Drink It Tour. Um, and they were stopping by all these different cities and hosting open bars. And so it fell on a Halloween of 2007. And um, Dan and I were working a lot and we're like, well, should we go or should we keep working, right? Because, you know, we have this ridiculous ethic of working too hard, probably. And uh, ultimately, we made the right decision. Let's grab some wigs and let's go to this open bar. And uh, so we went to uh, the open bar and we got a chance to, to meet Alexis and Steve, uh, the founders of Reddit. And we were chatting with them and, and uh, we, I think Dan, yeah, Dan mentioned something about Glumbert. And Alexis or Steve were just like, oh, yeah, we love Glover. So they actually knew his site because his site was on Reddit a lot. So we kind of formed a, we made contact and connection with uh, Alexis and Steve at that point. And um, that comes back later because afterwards we kind of followed up and we're like, nice to meet you. Let's catch up sometime. They never, they didn't respond. And then, um, so fast forward to the next year, 2008, I forget exactly when, but Dan turns to me and says, do you want to? There's this thing called Y Combinator. If we fill out this application, we might get fifteen thousand uh, dollars to to work on our company. And I said, Oh, well, we have nothing to lose by just filling this out. You can help us solidify some of our ideas by putting words to them. And so we filled it out and we submitted it. And then we got an email pretty quickly back from RTM, who's one of the partners at Reddit uh, at Y Combinator, asking us some question about collaborative filtering, which was something that we promised that we'd be doing and with Fligo to uh, provide better user recommendations. And we responded and 
they said um, <laughs> that we made it to the next round and that we would have to speak to some Y Combinator alumni first. And if that goes well, so they respond and they tell us that we got paired up with <laughs> Alexis and Steve from Reddit. Alexis and Steve. <laughs> <laughs> right. And now this is a lesson in like serendipity, being in the right place at the right time. Like I think a lot of that is what life is, is like being in the right place at the right time. And so there's an element of making that decision for yourself out there. So if we had decided not to go to the happy hour and instead keep working, I might not be where I am right now. Um, so we got on the phone with, Steve, uh, with uh, Alexis and Steve and we chatted for a while and they were like really grilling us super hard on, on, all, of the, on all of the product features and really getting deep. And, um, and I think it was Alexis. He's like, wait a second. Don't, don't we know you guys? And we're like, yeah, yeah, we met. Remember? And we're like, oh, yeah, cool. And then if, after that, everything was much less tense. Uh, and they gave us the recommendation. So we got flown out um, to, to uh, Mountain View. And this was, we had never experienced anything like this. And we basically were I think we were super nervous and we were just kept practicing and interviewing each other and at the time I think we were both pretty socially awkward so being so that whole process was just really challenging for us uh, but we did our best and we got flown out across the country I'd never been to California um, and I think it was a five minute interview so you fly all the way across the country um, and we go in for the interview and uh, I remember walking into the room and I kind of see people, there's like, you walk into a room with like five people around the table. It was very intimidating at the time. Uh, and it all went by in a blur. And I remember leaving feeling like we got this. Because um, they let it run for longer than the five minutes. And, and Jessica was like, kept looking at them, pointing at her watch, like it's time, it's time. Uh, and then they took a picture of us because they interviewed so many people, I don't remember and uh we went off and then that night they called us and uh so that we were we got in um and that was a major turning point i mean i remember being very excited we were at 21st amendment in uh in soma in san francisco uh and so at the time like, we were still living in boston and so we went back to boston and that's when yc started and i think it was the last batch uh to happen in boston on garden street in cambridge and <laughs> So the experience was very cool. Uh, at the time, for me personally, I didn't really know anyone in technology. It was like my co-founder, um, the community that I had in, in Boston, and it was not very entrepreneurial and kind of, there was a lot of doubt for like, you know, oh, you're doing that stupid, why would you think that's silly? Like, what do you think you're doing kind of attitude? Um, and so getting into YC, all of a sudden I met all of these other people that were just like us. And, I really felt I like I belonged and, and that was one of the big things for me in YC was finding that network and that community and so we were like a band of brothers yeah, at the time it was all men uh, in that group um, and there was like 20 companies maybe uh, two people in the company so it was like somewhere like 40 to 50 people and the way it worked was we would meet for dinner every Tuesday night and every Tuesday night, there would be a topic. Um, PG Paul Graham, who <laughs> is the founder um, and was still doing the day-to-day -day operations back then uh, would be teaching us about what it takes to run a startup, both in terms of like, operations and then also psychologically. Um, and also uh, we would get inside stories on like, things that seemed like you wouldn't have access to um, otherwise that brought in speakers. Like the I remember the founder of Lotus came in, the founder of Athmi, um, the older companies, tech companies back then, they weren't as old. Um, and we were able to ask them questions and then we would kind of all gather around and have dinner uh, together and, and uh, talk about things. And in between those dinners, you know, we'd hang out other feedback and host like pizza and beer nights where we would review each other's whatever and um that went on for about uh i think the whole program was was it six weeks or was it more eight weeks i don't really i don't remember exact maybe you know but halfway through you have to do that day, or prototype day. Prototype day is 
or you practice for demo day. Demo day is what happens at the end of Y Combinator where you present your, uh, you pitch your product to yeah. a number of investors. And so we, at the end, we ended up having three pitch days. I don't think it's that, I don't think it's like that anymore. I think it's just one. Um, but we did one in Boston and then we did two in California. Um, so we had to pitch three times. It was very nerve wracking, but it was like our first time ever doing anything like that. And we ended up, um, I think we didn't raise money immediately, but we decided after Y Combinator was over to move to San Francisco. And that was 2008. Um, so I'll, I'll pause there. Sure. Uh, I think that was like a really interesting uh, story, right? And so now I want to fast forward a little bit, right, to Treehouse. You mentioned that Treehouse was essentially a, a spinoff of Fligo, right, which was more uh, social oriented. And so could yeah. you tell me a little bit about what it was, um, like what you guys worked on, and eventually how you ended up getting Aqua hired, I guess I should say, by Google? Sure. <clears throat> so... Fligo, we, we built out all this technology, which was uh, related to video sharing. And you could kind of build your own custom video sites. Uh, I don't know if there's anything like that now. But yeah, it was like customizable. You could build your own YouTube, basically, whether it was you want to create something. Like you could use this for your, you could have used this if it existed for uh, what you're doing with your podcast. Uh, you know, customize it and have your own video channel. So we... We did that for a while and we actually had paying customers, um, but we were running out of money and we had, we were trying to raise money after we moved to San, we had just moved to San Francisco. And so we're trying to, we launched this on TechCrunch. I remember, I think it was February of uh, 2009. Um, and we started continuing trying to raise money. And so we were having all these conversations with investors and they kept turning us down and didn't, uh, one one other lesson that we had back then was just keep going back to the same people. I ended up meeting with some investor like three times, kind of pitching them again and getting another. And so, what led up to Treehouse was first we uh, noticed there's a um, this site called TwitPick, which was a back in the day like you couldn't share photos on Twitter. Uh, so someone bit, uh, built this thing called TwitPick, which let you upload a photo to Twitter through their API, but they would host the photo. And we saw that that was growing very quickly. And we, we also noticed that they don't support video. So we said, hey, we could build this thing called TwitVid uh, or like something like TwitVid instead. And we could probably build that in four days. And I've mentioned that to a couple of investors and they said, yeah, that seems really interesting. So we're like, okay, let's just do it. And we went heads down and I told, I told an investor on a Monday and then on a on a Friday, we had launched on TechCrunch. Wow. Very, very quickly. Um, and that led to uh, us closing our first check. And I think that, and that was from SV Angel, uh, Dave Lee uh, there. He, he was the one who uh, I think championed us uh, also being from Boston. And that led us to be able to now put pull together around. Um, so now we had some financing. And then with, with uh, sorry, I just got a phone call. With, so with TwitVid, um, things were going well. We were getting like the NBA on it, uh, Modest Yahoo, like all these celebrities were using it. It was really cool. Arnold Schwarzenegger posted some controversial videos on there. And um, we had Twit io as the domain name and we were trying to get twitbid.com but at the time uh we didn't have like the bank yet and mm -hmm. when we reached out they said that somebody else had been, like fifty thousand dollars for the domain and we're like well we can't wow. compete with that and um i think it was like three months later uh some twitbid.com launches same exact constant and two weeks later, they basically copied all of our style sheets and everything. So they looked the same, pretty wow. close, different logo, but like, you know, and to the untrained eye, somebody who's not really paying attention, the user like wouldn't notice the difference. 
so we noticed all our users, our high profile users are all kind of switching over. Um, and so we rebranded to Vidly, vid.ly, and that took us some time. And then we're, we felt like we we're like competing against our own traction. Um, and it was, yeah. it was a uh, kind of a tough spot during that process. Um, there was a race uh, to get integrated with uh, the Twitter clients. So back then, Twitter didn't have its own desktop or mobile clients. You had things like Tweety and TweetDeck and Twitterific and all these other uh, clients and of varying popularity. So the strategy was, you know, to how can we get to be the default video provider in these um, pieces of software and apps? And that became a race and it also became a financial race as well. Um, so I think had more, more funding. And uh, this was, I think we were still kind of like in the pro process of closing around. We didn't, we didn't have as much money, but it was paying like 50 grand or whatever to become the default provider. And we yeah. didn't compete with that again. Um, and uh, so we decided to start kind of building our own app where you could take a video and post it directly to Twitter from our app. And it was during that time that we started to wonder uh, about mobile. I, we hired consultants to do it. We didn't have the competency ourselves. And I remember, and that was around when MMS kind of launched. So yeah, you used to not be able to text photos uh, on the uh, iPhone. I didn't out. know that. Yeah. Uh, it, if, you, if you did, it wasn't, it was something that made it like very easy or free or something like that. So it wasn't really a habit that people had in the States. Um, my cousins in Europe had that habit. Like I went to visit them and they would be snapping photos on their flip phones back in the day and sending them. But at least in my group of friends in, uh, at the time, like that was not common. And so when that launched, it felt like a superpower. I was like, oh, I can just take a photo of what I'm doing and send it to somebody. That's really, that's like a really great, interesting way to communicate. And that's when Treehouse was born. Um, we were brainstorming, like, what if you could see your friend's camera? Would that be an interesting way to be able to keep up with what they're doing? Um, so we decided to build a little prototype. Uh, we decided not to go with consultants. And so basically bought two books on it. Objective C and on iPhone programming. Uh, went read through both of them in a week, did all the examples, and I'm like, all right, let's. I think I know enough to try to build this first version. So we built Treehouse and we shared it with our friends, and it was kind of everybody really loved it. And we, we were just kind of figuring out how to grow it. This was just to give it a time frame. This was 2010, I believe, at this point, and and uh, it was May or May of 2010 we launched, and then Instagram launched in, in August, and uh, they took off. And the diff the key differences were, um, you know, Treehouse was a private, so it was a bi-directional friend model, meaning like I friend you and you have to accept, um, mm -hmm. whereas Instagram was a unidirectional follow model. So like I follow you and you can follow me if you want. Um, now later they added private accounts as you know, but that's how it started. It was more like Twitter. And the other piece that they had was um, the influencers. So they had like Jack Dorsey posting on it often. So in the tech community, people were seeing Jack Dorsey posting these cool photos with filters and everybody was like, I want this. How do I do that? And that was the third piece was uh, the filters. So that's how they were different than us. And at the time, I think at that point we had been, it had been three or three and a half years since, since Dan and I had started uh, the whole Fligo adventure. And because I think of the success of Instagram, um, uh, through one of our investors uh, reached out, uh, Jared from, uh, slide uh, and he was working within Google and yeah. slide had an autonomous unit uh, for those of you that don't know slide slide was uh, 
they kind of made social games on Facebook, something like super, uh, it's called super poke, super poke pets. And, and so they made all these social games and they, they ended up being acquired by Google for you know, hundred million or something. And so they had an autonomous unit within Google, which means that theoretically they're, they can operate on their own and have total discretion over products and even have their own tech stack. So, um, Jared brought me into the Google cafeteria for lunch. I didn't really know why. We were just chatting. And then at the end of the conversation, he straight up said, we want to acquire your company. Uh, at the end of lunch, and I was like, oh, okay. Um, so you know, we had those proceedings, uh, ran the process. And amongst Dan and I, like ultimately, I think we were looking at our position, um, you know, we don't know anything about photo filters. It was kind of beyond us at that time. Also, so was the notion of hiring. And uh, we were just very inexperienced. Um, yeah. And so decided to take the offer because, um, you know, one, it's going to allow, uh, allow me to grow more and learn more. Um, it just seemed like kind of a unique opportunity. And two, like we just felt like we, we kind of reached a saturation point. Like as a team, we, we kind of learned as much as we could together and we weren't, I felt like we weren't continuing to grow. And so it was time to kind of change the scenery. And um, so that's why and how that, that ended up coming up. And so I joined Google as a product manager uh, on, on a product that was not really formed. And I basically came in uh, they couldn't tell me anything about what it was before I decided to join. So you just kind of have to join on blind faith that there'd be something interesting here. And uh, they were working on a photo sharing app to compete with Google, uh, with uh, Instagram. Okay. And it was, it was all over the place when I joined. Um, a, lot of, a lot of really interesting ideas, the kind of too many ingredients, if you will. So uh, I ended up working for six or seven months um, refining that product and we launched it something called photo vine which you can still look up um and it was a very interesting experience we had like 250,000 users in the first week um and then uh google from the very top uh, they decided to can the project um and that was like a very a very i think <laughs> clearly difficult experience um very painful for a lot of the team members um and that kind of is what led me to move on to YouTube and then Google Plus and, and yeah, but I'll, yeah. I'll pause there. Absolutely. So now, um, you know, I'm most interested in talking about Secret because I think like given its popularity, a lot of people listening will probably already know what it is. So I want to fast forward uh, a few years to the latest company you're working on, right? To, so to start off with, can you tell us a little bit about what the problem is that you encountered uh, and how you're fixing it at your latest company. For sure. Yeah, now that this is real close to home now because it's very it's present time. But I, I do want to say I appreciate all the questions that you're asking and your decision to skip the secret. And um, this shows, I think, a lot of awareness and I commend that. Um, so I appreciate that. And um, yeah, so after I left secret, um, I kind of didn't really know what to do with myself. And I ended up getting into music. Um, and I, I always had a background, not a background, but I'd say a hobby. Like I was always curious about music production and making music. Uh, I used to freestyle rap when I was a kid. <laughs> and oh, so I'd, I'd like, I'd like make beats and stuff. And it was always something that I like enjoyed doing. So I said, well, hey, like, you know, I just worked in tech for like seven years straight. Let me take a break. and." Get into music production and and so uh justin khan the founder of, of twitch um and also i see alumni is a, fr a friend of mine and he wanted to build a music studio in his apartment and i said you know what uh, i'll take on that project um, so i did build the studio out and worked tirelessly every day like trying to learn to produce music and i did that basically for four or five months and then went off to travel the world and uh continued to learn to produce music and I traveled all around 14 different countries just trying to you know expand my my uh, experience and also I kind of 
at the same time, I think was distancing myself a little bit from the Western world and, and, and uh, technology and all of that. Um, so coming up when I came, uh, and then the reason I share that part is I think having been out of the country for like two years on and off, almost three, um, was that I started to build an understanding of the value of community. Um, now I know we all can say like, yeah, friends are important, right? Like it's kind of something you understand, but when you feel the, the absence uh, and you feel the difference, um, it, it starts to kind of give it, gave it a different meaning. Um, so I decided to come back um, and to get involved again. And so I, I took a job up at um, Splice, which is a music technology company in New York. And um, the reason was, of course, I produce music and uh, the technology industry, the, the music technology industry is very fragmented and old and backwards and in a lot of ways. So Splice was doing uh, what I would do if I was going to work on this, just try to like bundle everything central, you know, make everything really easy for, for people to improve the music production. Um, and when I was doing that, I was working remotely. So I was based in LA and I would be working over Zoom every day. And so I had Zoom fatigue before it, that was even a term, <laughs> being on Zoom all day um, in meetings. And so when I, I kind of left Splice and then got really into the music tech, uh, into music production full time, had artists kind of really producing full songs and did the whole thing and kind of ultimately decided, uh, you know, the music industry is not, I think for me, uh, there's so many talented artists, but they are not in control. And it is just, it's just a really, it is what, you know, the rumors say. Um, so I decided to get music as a hobby and I um, started to get back into, start thinking about technology, right? So that brings us to like maybe not 2019, uh, 2000, yeah, 19. And so I had moved to LA. I had just been traveling for a few years and my com community is in San Francisco. Um, and so being down in LA, there's a lot of great things about it. Um, the lifestyle and like you know the diversity there's so much that it offers but but I would wake up in the mornings with like this feeling of deep sadness and like this what like a feeling like an urge like I wanted to cry and I'm like, what is happening to me like I should be happy this is all great um, yeah. and it took me some time to to realize that I think that I was lonely um, and I was work. I, I was, and I still have a therapist. I've been working with a therapist just to really kind of like talk about this stuff and really gain under gain understanding of what's going on. And um, around that time as well, I went through a breakup that was kind of very, very challenging for me. Um, kind of probably the most most painful uh, breakup that I've ever had. And it was less about the relationship. And I think it was more about my own relationship with myself. And so all these things were starting to kind of come to my attention about community, about self-love, um, about, you know, the value of communication, um, the value of vulnerability and openness. Um, and all of these practices kind of started to give me a more sense of well-being. And around the time of that breakup I, is when I reconnected with my friend, Sean, who is who I had met in a men's group in San Francisco. And the reason I reached out to him was because we were part of a men's group and our context was always to talk about our emotions. I felt like, you know, he would be able to take that call. And he had just gotten back from Bali and he was there on a, his own kind of spiritual journey. And he landed down in LA and I, I hadn't seen him in a couple of years. Um, and so we reconnected and he, he helped me through the breakup. Um, it was really just a fantastic uh, support. And um, at the time, I didn't know anything about like his, his professional background or anything, right? We were just two humans. And uh, we talked a lot about relationships and um, he taught me a lot about what he knew. And that led to eventually... Um, 
I, I found out that he like writes code and I was like, what you write code? No way. Like we should, we should hack on something. And we started to kind of brainstorming. And um, I went out to Boston for Thanksgiving and uh, around Thanksgiving, um, I have this practice that I would recommend to everyone, which is I like to kind of go through my list of friends and, you know, kind of look at who did I rest who have I messaged in the past like month and see who I feel gratitude towards. Um, like, and so I would just send little voice messages and say, Hey, you know, I, I, pre I really appreciate you for this and for that reason. And thank you. And, and I send that to as many people as seems fit. And after I do that, I always feel this tremendous level of energy. My mood is different. My mood is improved. My, uh, my openness to people has expanded, right? Like there, I've noticed these fundamental changes in my, my mood and my health. And so when I came back, I, I told Sean about that experience and said like, why don't we work on something in social wellness? Uh, and, this, and this feeling of like, we didn't call it social wellness at the time, but like, like something like that experience, how can we give people that feeling more? And that's when we decided to um, pursue a company. And so the, the mission of the company um, is kind of embodied in that story, which is we believe that there is a thing called social wellness, just like there's physical wellness and there's mental health. There's also social health and, and the World Health Organization actually describes health as physical and social well-being but we don't often talk about social well-being the way that we talk about those the other two you know physical health you have gyms you have nutrition you have all these things that are like super well defined yeah. and, and popular now mental health is you know way more popular now like going to therapy uh, you know calm headspace meditation like th these practices are all becoming commonplace and and less stigmatized they used to be stigmatized and now social health, we said, there's nothing really here in, in the consumer world. Um, if you look at Facebook, Instagram, uh, Twitter, like they, they're all very performative and they don't get me wrong. Like there is use, uh, good use in being able to connect with people through that. TikTok is something I don't like, I don't use it enough to, to speak with confidence, but you know, to me, that's like, entertainment um it's media um, and correct me if, if i'm wrong but it doesn't seem like you know you're, the place where you're like deeply connecting personally yeah. with the relationships of people in your life so we said can first can this be done through technology this notion of social wellness of of eliciting this feeling of of positive mood changes and feeling connected feeling less lonely um experience everything that social, your social relationships contribute to that, um, can it be facilitated by technology? And so we believed it could. And then, so we set out to, to, to do that. We didn't even have a product. We just knew that that is what we wanted to change in the world. And we were gonna go and we, uh, experiment. So we raised some money um, led by Fuel, Chris Howard at Fuel Capital um, and initialized you know, Gary Tan, he was in our batch in YC, we go way back, in Alexis. <laughs> so the Alexis thread runs deep in, in my uh, professional life. And so we decided uh, to build out a, like a, we have to build out a pipeline, right? Because when you don't have an idea, a particular idea, you need a framework. Uh, so the first thing yeah. is like build a framework for how we're going to, how do we come up with ideas? Like, how do we decide to, or how do we validate the idea? When do we build a prototype? When do we go to market? So we built a pipeline. There's a whole really cool thing in Notion with like product briefs. You know, we had a set of questions we had to answer a set of sources of inspiration, and we kind of ran this process for a while. Um, and um, yeah, so that was, the, that was the origin of the company. <laughs> Got it. Wow, it's really, it's really interesting. Uh, that was quite the journey you had, you know, uh, for the idea. So now I want to yeah. sort of um, zoom out and look at the big picture of things, right? So you've launched four companies that have all been like very successful. And so I'm curious, 
what is like if you have to boil everything down to like one key learning lesson or one key thing that has affected you from like one company to the next that you've tried to improve on or have tried to implement in every company that you've uh, started, what is like that one key trait or learning lesson? Mm. One key lesson. Um, the first thing that immediately came to mind um, is always build for yourself. And what that means to me was, I think, or the, the way that that came back to me was um, during this recent, this current venture, um, we kind of veered away from that and we were got into building like SaaS products and um, it, it, it felt a bit as a creative, maybe I should say, always build for yourself. Um, solving a problem that you have gives you immediate empathy, kind of unique insight into what it is. And then when you build it, you can try it <laughs> and then you can use it with you know, your community. Um, that to me feels like for in my journey is, is very important. And we just recently came back around to that now where we are building for ourselves. And I'll tell you, it feels so much different than we try to convince somebody else to use something they build. Yeah. Um, and I think also like that extends to like who is the initial community, right? Think about the initial community of what you're of what you're trying to do. Who is this for? Literally name them. Who are they sure. in your life? And speak to them. Um, because it's it's very easy to get caught in the world of ideas, thinking of concepts in a vacuum. Um, but if you never put the rubber to the road, if you don't if you don't know where the road but the rubber is um then you can end up kind of i think losing losing a lot of time uh, got it so that, that's one one key lesson um, i'm sure there are many more that's the first yeah. one that came to mind i think that's quite interesting you know it's something that i've never really thought about build for yourself um i've always thought about like consumer oriented building find probably the consumer hasn't built off of that but, you know i think that's very interesting lens to operate through um, so yeah, um, back to like the questions themselves. Um, the last two questions I have for you are ones that I ask to every guest. And so the first one is if you were back to being a teenager with like COVID happening and all of that, what would you build or how would you make money? <laughs> oh man, like a teenager in this modern day. Yeah. Uh, um, I almost want to flip that question back around to you. Um, because it's kind of funny because you know, build for yourself, right? I think one of the one of the I'll answer the question, but this is one note, like, um, yeah, like I I think I've explicitly said we're not going to build try to build a social app for teenagers. Let's build one for millennials because um, like I can't pretend to know what you know what what's going on with teenagers nowadays, and I'm actually be really curious to hear your perspective uh, on that because it's not something I have too much. Uh, too much insight into but yeah to entertain the question uh, i would say i would i always start by asking questions and understanding the context and so okay. i would look at you know at what's going on with with my life personally where where do i feel like my needs are not being met uh, where is there scarcity uh, in my own life and then I would solve the problem for myself. Um, and then I would do doing it how, you know, through whatever means. It doesn't only have to be technology, yeah. right? Like you could solve it with just good old fashioned reaching out and talking to people. Um, you could solve it with like very light kind of automations and you know, no code solutions um, and test things out to solve the problem for yourself and for others. And then if that seems to be resonating with people, then um, and you have like a solid community that's forming around the effort that you're pursuing, then then you can start to think about um, build it a bit more formally. Absolutely. Um, so before I answer the flip around version of your question, uh, the final question I have for you is, um, what's your? Uh, this is the question. This is another question I ask to everyone, which is. What is your uh, favorite number? And I think that every number does have a significance behind it or like some way you got to that number. So what is the significance behind that favorite number? You know, I do have a favorite number. 
that's not what something I think of often, but it came to mind right when you asked, which is the number seven. Um, I don't know why. I remember I was in like kind of therapy class, like uh, you know, maybe eight or nine years old, and, and uh, I had to pick a number, and I picked seven, and then I, that ended up. I won like the best pack of cards or something like that and ever since that has kind of been that number but it's something about it that feels like uh it's it's not like divisible it's not even it's it's like underneath 10 so it kind of feels like a unique a unique number it's not too close to 10 it's not too close to one i don't know just feeling into the the vibe of the number that's that's maybe what it is and there's always i guess lucky seven is a thing yeah so, yeah it, isn't it answer. also the number in, in uh, craps? Maybe? I think yeah. so. I'd have to ask my dad on that. He plays craps. But um, <laughs> yeah, don't quote me on that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I think that brings us to a really nice, uh, unique ending uh, for the recording. So I just wanted to thank you so much for coming on again. Yeah, no, this was great. I'm very impressed. And, you know, I've done a lot of interviews in my life. And, uh, to be interviewed so well by uh, I don't want to be ageist but by you know the high school <laughs> students very impressive so keep up the great work thank you thank you